Hey everyone, um, so we are recording live a uh, lecture over the chapter 5 lecture of our HTML and CSS curriculum. And uh, I always like to start a lecture with discussing the importance of a topic. You know, um, I think it's that's kind of the what's behind, you know, I could tell you what to study. You know, I could, you know, have you study it, but it's always important to understand why. Why are we studying this? Um, you know, if you can't answer that question of why are we studying it, then it kind of, um, uh, it's just an important piece. Why, why are you going to school? Why are you studying this topic? What, why are you doing this? Uh, and so why would we study the CSS box model? You know, we kind of go back a few chapters. We're on chapter five, but really chapters one through four were just the fundamentals of uh, the internet. You know, how the internet is um, structured or what's the infrastructure, I should say, of the internet. Uh, with the routers and the uh, wide area networks and local area networks and all the protocols like HTTP and the World Wide Web that come together to make that up. Uh, then chapters, you know, two, three, and four were really just on the fundamentals of HTML and the fundamentals of CSS. So their importance are that if you're going to code websites and you're going to write code to build custom sites, you have to know HTML, you have to know CSS, and the, those were the fundamentals. And so, um, you know, that was kind of like getting out of the gates, you know, with these languages, what's a tag, what's a rule, what's an attribute, you know, what's a selector, you know, and things of that nature. But, but now we're past the fundamentals. And so we got the fundamentals behind us, or, or hopefully you're feeling more confident with those fundamentals because now we're building on top of those fundamentals. And so we, we introduced the concept of this box model. And so here's this new chapter, this new concept. What's the importance? Why are we studying it? Um, so CSS is used for a couple of things and you've already been doing one of those things and that's with colors and font sizes and so CSS has versions just like HTML has versions and um, you know CSS version 1 really primarily changed font colors and it changed font sizes and so you're, you're dealing with colors and you're, you're dealing with sizes CSS version 2 started moving things around on the page, okay? In other words, you know, we've got this image, and I want to use CSS to position it. Where is it on? Is it on the left? Is it on the right? Is it on the upper right, lower? You know, where is it at on the page? And not just an image, but everything. The entire layout of your page is done with CSS, okay? And so, you know, CSS version 2 started dealing with layout, and, and that's the layout of your page. And so that's pretty important. Obviously, where things are at or on the page is extremely important. And so why do we study the box model? The box model is the, the first step that you have to understand to understand positioning. Now, there are more steps besides the box model. The box model is just step one. Okay, but if you don't understand the box model, you can't take step two. Okay, so that's why this chapter is very important is that this is the beginning step to understanding positioning in CSS. We've already done some stuff with colors and we've already done some stuff with font sizes, but that's kind of like CSS version one. CSS version two introduced positioning, and then there's also CSS version three, which CSS version three um, deals with more with what was considered modernizing CSS. In other words, there were certain things that websites had that we could not do with CSS. And then CSS version 3 introduced ways to do those things. Okay, and I'll just give you an example. We do have like gradients now. 
uh, a, a, a gradient is a color that goes from you know you know one color and it fades into another color and we used to not have a way to do gradients with CSS until CSS version 3 and gradients were were popular at you know at various points it's kind of like fashion fashion comes and goes you know gradients are, are kind of the same way in that they their popularity comes and goes on the web and, and how they're used but now we have CSS version 3 which allows us to use gradients so again kind of a long lengthy uh, explanation as to why the box model is important it's important because if you're gonna move things around on the page and use CSS for positioning which you're gonna do um, you, you have to understand these things and so we're gonna get into the use of the box model I kind of you know spoiled that one it's it's ultimately used for positioning um, how the box model can be used uh, for spacing on the page uh, we'll talk about collapsed margins um, which I've, I've kind of foreshadowed that in a prior lecture already um, we'll go through properties of a block like height width margin padding border background color background image and then we'll get into some CSS3 features at the end of this for uh, rounded corners, uh, box shadows. We had text shadows, but, but there's also box shadows uh, as well as gradients, background gradients. And so um, very simply, the box model uh, is that every piece of content has a a box around it and you might not see that box but there is a box uh, in fact there's multiple boxes you can kind of see here this innermost box is the box for the content okay then the box around that is the box for the padding and then the box around that is the box for the margin now you'll notice here after the padding there's a, a solid line that's not dashed okay and that's your border you might remember last chapter we messed with borders and I showed you how to turn on a border with border style border width and border color okay so you'll you'll notice that there's content then there's padding part of the box model is also the border so this solid line here represents the border and then outside of that you've got the margin okay so the way that that's really simple for for me to remember this is that if you want to move content around inside of the border you use padding so here we've got this border and if you want to move if you want to move this content away from the left border you would add padding so if you want to move content around inside of the border you use padding if you want to move content around on the page outside of the border and really away from other elements like you got two paragraphs and you want to move one down away from the other one you would use margin so the, so the real simple way to remember this is inside of the border you got padding outside of the border and you're, you want to move content around away from other elements you use margin so if you want to move content around inside of the border padding if you want to move content around from other elements including the the, the page you use margin and so I will and give me some feedback guys uh, because some people are saying it's kind of hard to see the the code let me see if you can see this code a little bit clearer hopefully you can see this a little bit better on the on the recording um, so let me open up and I'll just open up the uh, homework chapter 4 folder chapter 5 folder it should be empty Is it a little bit easier to see this? Type in chat if you can see this okay.
Okay, good. Thank you. You can see it better. Awesome. Okay, so what I'm going to have here is I just have a simple paragraph. And I'm going to type in the word lorem. And this is built into Visual Studio. And so what, what lorem represents is uh, lorem ipsum. Lorem ipsum is content filler. In other words, this is just some Latin that's content filler. If you hit, if you type in lorem and then hit tab, you'll notice it just fills you up with a bunch of content filler. And so there are lorem ipsum generators, and I'm sure you can configure how many sentences are in each paragraph and all this kind of gibberish. But the point being is that I don't really care what this says. I just want content filler. And then what I'll do is view this in the browser. And what I'm going to demonstrate here is the box model. Okay, and I really like looking at the box model in, uh, in Chrome using the inspect tool. So if you right click and inspect, and then I select the element, this is a very useful tool. Notice I, I clicked this select an element icon here. Then I selected what I want to look at. I want to look at the box model for this paragraph. That's really the only thing I have on the page. Now what you'll notice is that paragraphs, over here in Chrome, it shows me how much space is the content taking up, and it's highlighting it in blue. So the content is being highlighted in blue. The padding is in green. You'll notice that by default, there's no padding on this paragraph. There's no green. I can highlight the blue. That's content. There's no padding. You cannot see a border, but you can see you can see some margin. You can even see a number there, 16, um, which I believe is pixels. So there's 16 pixels of margin on the top, and there's 16 pixels of margin on the bottom. And so by default, paragraphs have margin. And you can tell that by inspecting the box model. They have no padding and they have no border. So if I, excuse me, if I want to move content around inside of the box, I use padding. And so maybe on this screen, I want to move this text over from the left inside of from where the border is. So let's see what happens when I add padding. And so I can do some embedded CSS on my paragraph. I can say padding to the left 30 pixels. And you can see that it does in fact push it over. And if I highlight, now I see a little bit of green on my paragraph. I could see 30 pixels of padding on the left on my Chrome uh, styles, and I still have margin, right? So you could see that it pushes it over from the left. Now, how does that differ from margin from the left? Well, really not too different in the sense that it's still pushing that content over from the left but now you could see that I've got a little bit of margin let's see it didn't really work well for my margin padding left maybe I needed to refresh let's see padding left there you go you see the padding margin left it's still pushed over Let me refresh it's still pushed over however it's not what I anticipated probably because it's pushing off of the page but you can see that it pushed it over 
I'm gonna take a look at a little closer look at that and see what what's going what's going on there. Oh, there it was. There, now you can see it. There it is. I wasn't selecting my element right. Now you can see. I'm mean, scratching my head, thinking I was doing something wrong. I was like, "This is a little basic to be messing up." Now you can see the margin on the left. Glad my demonstration didn't break in the first five minutes. Okay, Let me get the chat pulled up here. All right, everyone's doing good so far. So you can see this is the beginning of pushing things around. And the beginning of pushing things around is the beginning of, of positioning with CSS. Um, I'm going to get rid of my margin here. I'm going to add another paragraph. Type in lorem tab. And now you can see I've got two paragraphs. And what happens when you have two paragraphs, one of the objectives here on the PowerPoint was describe the effect of collapsed margins. This idea of collapsed margins is that when you have block level elements, their margins run together. And so they, they essentially collapse. And so if I inspect this top paragraph, you can see on the top paragraph, you can see there's 16 pixels of margin on the bottom that actually collapses into the 16 pixels of margin on the top. So those two block level elements, instead of like doing double spacing essentially, uh, they do single spacing and, and their margins collapse. So if I wanted those if I wanted those paragraphs to essentially be on top of or, or, or to be right next to one another, okay, I'd have to zero out the margin on the bottom of this paragraph, and I'd have to zero out the margin on the top of this paragraph. And that, that would be how I would get these two paragraphs to be literally right on top of one another. And again, normally do you want line breaks in your paragraphs? Probably. so. So more than likely you're not doing this because you probably just want that space there. But to demonstrate how to do this real quick, oops. I'll give them both IDs and I'll go into my style. I know that one's on top, margin bottom, you just say zero, you don't have to say PX. And just to demo this, you can see that the space is still there, even though if I click that top paragraph, you can see I just have margin on the top now, I don't have margin on the bottom. Well, the reason that space is still there is because now the second paragraph has margin on the top. So if I go in here and I target my second paragraph, and I do margin top zero. Now you can see they run together. Okay, so working with the box model, working with margin and padding, um, there are borders on all of these, just like I showed in the last lecture. Uh, thin. So you can kind of see that this each paragraph has its own border, and that that middle that middle one that middle line is a little bit thicker because those borders aren't collapsing like the margin is collapsing. But uh, let's you know for example I can come in here and say padding to the left ten percent. So you can use percents on these. Oops. And so I added some padding there. 
And so again, um, so chapter five is the box model. Chapter six is dealing more with positioning. And so um, one thing that I forgot to mention, well, not that I forgot, but I'm, I'm gonna mention it now. Uh, when it comes to CSS, number one, there's a good learning curve. And so you've already started on that learning curve as far as how to write CSS. And so part of the challenge of learning CSS is learning those fundamentals. After you get past the learning curve, in my opinion, the hardest thing to do with CSS is positioning. The thing that takes the most practice is positioning. You know, I can explain positioning, um, but it definitely takes practice. It's, it's much like playing a musical instrument. You know, I could tell you how to play the drums, but unless you actually sit down and practice playing the drums, you won't get good at it. And CSS positioning is the same way. You have to practice positioning to get good at it. And so what I'm doing here is I'm kind of describing these, these fundamentals, but uh, that's, that, that's what makes positioning challenging or, or hard, is that it really does take practice. Um, and so what you'll, what you'll see here is that you've got margin on all four sides. You got margin on the top, left, right, and bottom. You got padding on all four sides. You got borders on all four sides. And that's what this picture does kind of a crappy job of, of explaining, <laughs> is that um, there's, there's margin, padding, and border on all four sides, as well as, here's, here's a, an important rule. Any block level element, any block level element can have a custom width or height set. And so our paragraphs have a border, and right now that border, you'll see that that border goes 100% width of the container that it's in, right? Since the container that this paragraph is in is the body, basically you would say it's parent's container, uh, the body is 100% width, therefore the paragraph is 100% of that, so 100 uh, but you can have a custom width. You do something like width of 50%. And now the width of an element, and this is, this is part of something we will learn. The width of an element does not include padding by default. Okay, and that's probably something that we will change, but that you'll see that these paragraphs don't have the same width. And you're going, well, why is that? Well, this paragraph has padding, and that's not calculated into the width, which is something that it's kind of a default behavior. Um, but if we get rid of that padding, we will change that because we don't normally you think of the width, the width is typically thought of everything within the border and in. And so by default, the border and padding is not calculated into the width. And so that's kind of counterintuitive. And so there's some code that we can write that changes that. And so we could say, okay, 50% width will include the padding and include, um, and include the border. But now here you can see that our paragraphs are in fact 50% width and we don't have any um, padding or borders configured. Um, so that's what this little width says. There, there's basically a width attribute. There's a width attribute that allows you to custom set the width of block level elements. And um, you'll notice if I try and do that on an anchor tag, it's not gonna work for me. An anchor tag is an inline element And if I were to try and style my link with a custom width, it doesn't work. You can only do that on block level elements. 
Let me put a border on it so you could see. See, I put the border on my link, even though the, the link has a width of 50%, it's not working because again, it's an inline element. And again, that linking to a pound is uh, what I call a dummy link. It's basically a link that doesn't go anywhere. <clears throat> And so here's uh, the bullet that says, uh, by default, margin, border, and padding are not included in the width and height calculations. Okay, so you, I'm, I'm glad I actually showed that um, because there's a way to change that. And that's box sizing. So the property is CSS box sizing Um, this is called content box and so this this is the default box sizing content box is the default CSS sizing behavior but we can change it to box sizing border box and so what you do is you apply this property and this value to the star selector and then it will account for border and padding in your calculations and so let's let's do this let's come back in here I think I had a padding left 10% and when I had that we got this output and you're saying wait a minute they're both 50% why is one wider than the other and that's because the padding which is this green piece right here was not being calculated in the width and so what we do is we do we use the star selector which this is a wild card selector it's basically selecting all of your elements we use the box sizing border box and that should work it's not working let me, uh, let me refresh the page here I'm gonna pause the video I'm gonna troubleshoot this and figure out why oh yeah it is they're both 50% now gosh they're still padding it is working they're still padding but notice they're the same width now before the the width was different I was looking at the wrong thing it is working anyways it's good good time for a break here uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video we've covered a lot of material already so let's get a good break in Okay, everybody, we are back. Took a good break, had a little chat about off-topic things, but now we're back in the code, focusing on HTML, CSS, the box model. And uh, we left off on the PowerPoint, kind of talking about border box. Um, I, I used that box sizing border box. Now, one thing, you know, this could be boilerplate CSS for you. Uh, it's not a bad idea to, you know, just go ahead and throw this rule in just about any document that you're working on because this is just a general good practice. Okay, so, so you know, hard requirement, no. Is it a good idea? Yes. Again, notice here we got our paragraphs that are 50% width. And, and now this 50% width includes the padding that we have on this second paragraph, where if I take this rule back out and it goes to the default, you can see the second paragraph is now wider. The 50% is actually wider because it does not calculate the border or the padding on the width calculation. Um, so it's just kind of a good thing. Again, I think it's more intuitive this way to say okay well we're going to include we're going to include the padding and we're going to include the border as part of our calculations <clears throat> so that's kind of where we left off um, the book does you know a couple of examples of you know just turning on borders and again every element has a border a paragraph a heading uh, uh, h1 um, 
UL, uh, LI, they all have borders. They're just invisible. And so by messing with this border property, you can turn turn on the borders and, and begin to see how things are uh, butting up against one another and how they're positioned on the page. Um, I did mention that any block level element can have a custom width and can have a custom height. And so by default, the height of something is based on the content. So if you got a long paragraph, that paragraph is just going to, you know, that's going to determine its height. However, if you want to force a bigger height, you could you could say, okay, well, this height is 125 pixels. And we can come down here onto our bottom guy paragraph here. And we can say height of 300 pixels. And you can see that now our paragraph takes up more space on the page. And so just like you could set a custom width on a block level element, you could set a custom height on a block level element. Um, then there's these other properties that are similar to, to width and height called min width and max width. Okay, So the way these are different is that minimum width will will be 450 pixels but it it can also potentially get wider so min width is specifies the minimum obviously you know the minimum width but then depending on the content that within it if the content needs to go wider the width of the paragraph can can do that it can go wider Max width is then the opposite. Max width is the idea of um, a paragraph will not go any wider than 600 pixels. And kind of the same idea between min height and max height. It can get, it can get taller than 120 pixels, uh, but then max height, it kind of caps out at 160 pixels. So a couple other properties to set uh, width and height. Okay, now a bunch of different, let's, let's look at margin. Okay, because there's a bunch of ways, you know, here I set an individual margin on the bottom of our paragraph. Well, so you got the margin bottom property, you got the margin left property, margin right, margin top. So there's four margin properties. Well, that's kind of annoying. So, so they made a shorthand. They said, "Okay, margin." Okay, so if we do something like 10, 20, 30. Okay, the way this works is like a clock. So it's clock clockwise. We start at the top, 10 pixels at the top. Then we go to the right, 20 pixels on the right. Then we go to the bottom. 30 pixels on the bottom, 40 pixels on the left. And so <clears throat> if I inspect this paragraph, I should expect to see and in here in the box, 10 on the top, 20 on the right, 30 on the bottom, 40 on the left. And you can kind of see how that space is out. Now you don't see you actually don't see in this example the margin on the on the right because it's not butting up against anything right you can see the margin on the bottom because it bumps up against the paragraph you can see it on the left it bumps up against the page and on the top it bump butts up against the page but this this paragraph would have to be wide enough you know to butt up against the right hand side of the page it's just not wide enough but you got 10 20 30 40 so that's another this is your shorthand way of configuring margin with this uh, margin property there's also there's also this shorthand which means 10 at the top and bottom so 10 pixels top bottom 20 pixels left in the right so 20 left and right 10 top bottom and then of course there's 
the one that I don't use the most, and I think is the most confusing, is the three. This is top, 10 pixels on the top, 20 on the left and the right, and then 30 on the bottom. Again, this is the, the one with the, the shorthand with the three numbers is my least favorite, but I'll kind of inspect that. So you see 10 on the top, 20 on the left and the right, 30 on the bottom. So looking at our Chrome tools, I mean, this has to be the most useful tool when it comes to this stuff, is this Chrome tool that shows you the blues in the content, the green, the green is a padding, you got one pixel border, and there's your margin. So very useful tool there. There's all the different ways to set margin. Padding has the same thing, all the same. Oh, by the way, a single number is all four sides. So if I were to say margin 10, that's that's 10 pixels on all four sides, right? So you got the individual properties. You got the shorthand with four numbers. You got the shorthand with two numbers. You got the shorthand with one number. And you got the shorthand with three numbers. That would be 40 pixels of margin on all four sides. Same thing for padding. Padding works the same way. You can set the individual properties, or you could use the shorthand with all the four different options. OK, a couple of recommendations. Um, and, I, and these are, again, from, from Google. OK. When you're setting margin and padding width and height, you want to use what's called root M's, REMs, root M's. We're going to cover this in a little bit more detail. For your borders, you might use pixels. For your height and your width, now it's a little overlapping here because you can see width and height could also be what is called viewport height and viewport width. Okay, so again, I think in the last um, slideshow I had some uh, recommended practices and I recommended you know taking a screenshot of this and kind of, of uh, coming back to this. Specifically, next chapter we're going to be doing a lot with these measurements because we haven't used REMs or VHs or VWs much. That's viewport height, viewport width. But why these are recommended is that these are going to help responsive uh, web design. So as we begin coding our sites, um, as we begin coding our sites uh, to look good in widescreen monitors and tablets and cell phones, uh, you want to use these measurements so that the page responds appropriately and kind of resizes appropriately is what that boils down to when I say it responds appropriately. All right. Um, then there's just several examples of using margin and padding. Um, by default, you know, our paragraphs have, have margin. And so you might target several selectors and zero out their margin and zero out their padding if you don't want you know these elements to have default margin and padding this is kind of a uh, a solution for that so that they don't have that default spacing and some developers like that um, you know I'm, I'm okay either way if you want to do something like that all right so now we're just working with margins and paddings really nothing Um, the reset selector is highlighted in uh, yellow. It's highlighted. Um, what the reset selector does is it targets every element. Again, we're working with that star selector. And we do margin zero, padding zero. So the same selector here that does box sizing border box. 
That's going to zero out the margin and padding on all of our headings, on all of our paragraphs, on all of our ULs and LI, all of our tags. Um, so again, some people like to do that. That's an option for you. Um, but, but it's called the reset selector. The reset selector uses star as the selector and zeros out the margin and padding. Okay, so when I I mentioned that like in a homework or in a lab or a test, if I if I ask you to use the reset selector, that means your your selector is star, and what you're doing with star is you're zeroing out the margin and the padding. Okay. I wouldn't doubt that that's on your homework, lab, and or test. Now, um, recommendation though, because this is what the book recommends, um, is using normalize instead of, instead of this universal CSS re reset. Okay, and so you see here, the book does kind of recommend it, however, uh, you know, more of an industry standard is to use a normalize as opposed to using as opposed to using this. So if I asked for a reset selector um, and you give me this, I'll accept it. Or if you give me a normalize, you link to normalize first, and then underneath your normalized, you link to your custom CSS. Uh, I'll accept that as well. So I, I would accept either. However, the recommended practice is normalize. Okay. Um, now this slideshow goes into borders, and I know. Uh, I'll look. I'll look in the chat. Would you guys confirm that we covered borders last chapter? I I know it was a long lecture, but I think towards the end, we covered borders. Do you guys remember that or no? Just say yes or no if you remember in the chat. If you don't remember, that's fine. But I think we did cover it. Okay. Kind of remember it. So what, what you're dealing with with borders is you're dealing with a thickness. And you, with a thickness, you can use a text or you can use a width. <laughs> Jake, I'm right there with you. You have a thickness, again, you can use text or pixels. You have a type, and you have a color. I'm going to throw in a little laugh on that. So, um, what's required for a border? Because it has a default color. The default color is black. And the default style is solid. So I think just by setting the border width, that's, well, I'm sorry, border, border width and border style. You have to give it those two things. Let me see if I turn the border width off. Okay, so really all you need to do is give it a border style because it has a default width and it has a default color, but it doesn't have a different border style. So what are the different border styles? Well, they kind of show you here. Dotted, dashed, there's a groove, a double line, a solid line, ridge, inset, outset. Um, again, keep in mind that you know some of these borders, um, browsers don't always support all the CSS rules. Um, so in my experience, some of these borders were not well supported by like Chrome, uh, not Chrome, uh, Internet Explorer. And so you just got to be careful when you're using them. There's also the border radius property. And so uh, obviously our boxes are just that, they're boxes. And so if you put a background color on the box, you're going to see you're going to see that in the page. And so if I say background color, you know, you're going to see you're going to see boxes. And so uh, kind of a trendy thing there for a while was 
you know, uh, because everything was so boxy in, in web pages, um, they started to a trend, uh, a web design trend was to kind of soften the corners and not make everything so boxy and make things a little bit more rounded. And so um, with CSS3, they introduced a new property called border radius. Um, and it goes something like this. So if I say border radius, I just say 15 pixels, that's kind of like rounding it. You can see that we're not so boxy anymore. And so our paragraphs are no longer boxes, but they're, they're now rounded corners. Um, and so there is your border radius. Now border radius can definitely get uh, more complex. And if you look at the PowerPoint, um, if you want to set different amounts of curve on each corner, you could do so. It starts with the top left, top right, lower right, lower left. So again, kind of clockwise starting in top left. And then you can um, also on your, on your boxes, right, even if they're rounded corners, on your boxes, you can have a boxed shadow. So that was another kind of thing is to start adding shadows. Um, this, uh, the box shadow, um, I always like to use something like a CSS3 generator. This is a good website to help you with all these CSS3 properties. So here's some of the popular CSS3 properties. Um, and, and the coding for them, you know, um, can be hard to visualize. In other words, what would this box shadow actually look like? And so you use this tool here and it kind of gives you an idea. Like if I do like a, and you use this tool and it gives you a visual idea of <clears throat> what the box shadow would look like if you were to take the box shadow, five pixel, five pixel, five pixel in black. Now you also see, so there is the recommended CSS property, but then you also see this one, which is WebKit box shadow. WebKit is the rendering engine that Chrome uses. So it's the, it's the software built into Chrome that reads HTML and draws the picture. Okay, that's the rendering engine. Okay, and WebKit, kind of a, interestingly enough, um, you might be familiar, and if you could see my screen down here, we got our new Microsoft Edge. Um, so Internet Explorer historically was so bad. They had their own um, rendering engine. And with this transition to uh, Edge, Microsoft is now using this Google's rendering engine. So, so Microsoft transitioned from using its own rendering engine to using WebKit. So believe it or not, and as long as I've been around, I've never recommended a Microsoft browser. Um, but because it's more like Chrome, you know, I will at least say that I, I'm not hating it. So Microsoft Edge on the surface, because it's using WebKit now, uh, is better than any old Internet Explorer. So that's kind of a cool, cool new thing with, with Microsoft's latest uh, browser here. Um, you know, and, and the thing that unfortunately, and I'm sure many of you know this, but if not, um, you know, totally fine. Um, Chrome is known for, unfortunately, being a bit of a resource hog. Yeah, yeah, we're talking about the new edge. Chrome is known for being uh, a little bit of a resource hog and, uh, and kind of using all of your system resources, specifically your RAM. And, uh, you know, that's just, if you're, if you're a user of Chrome, you might notice that, you know, it, it, 
has at times been a little bit resource heavy and that would be a downfall of Chrome and, and they're working on fixing that that's that's something that Google has actively said that they're working on fixing but kind of in the meantime I've been using more edge lately just a little bit okay so again this can kind of help you visualize what the horizontal length is what the vertical length is blur radius you know you kind of got that little blurred edge and so you know to learn these different properties this is a really great tool to kind of give you an idea and then I can kind of just copy the code so I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of these uh, Actually, that's a terrible. Let me go back to my. Something like that. Then can go back to here and put my. Now, I didn't mention why, why this property is vendor specific. So ideally, every, um, Every browser understands the box shadow property that's the recommended by the W3C property to use. Um, however, before browsers used the recommended properties, they all, every rendering engine had its own vendor specific property. And so that's where these rules come in, kind of like backwards compatibility. So like to make sure that it's good in Chrome, use this WebKit box shadow. Um, and now we've got rounded corners and we've got box shadows. All right. So you can kind of see there some uh, box shadows and some rounded corners. All right, we are looking at less than 10 slides to go. I've been going for a little bit of time. I'm gonna take a, another break here in the video. I'm gonna go ahead and pause. Okay, we're back from the, uh, from the break here. And where we left off um, was dealing with backgrounds. And so there's a couple of things here, if, even if you look at the heading, there's background colors and there's background images. Um, so I'm gonna background color is pretty straightforward. Um, in fact, I've I've already done background color, you know, on our paragraph tags, and so um, we've already covered that. I'm gonna cover background image, and so let me go. I'm just going to download like a little check mark. It's going to download this image. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this check mark. Save image as. I'm going to save it into my folder. I'm going to use that as a background image. So let's go all student work. And so I can demonstrate background images with this check mark. I think I'm doing this out of homework, chapter five. And I'll just call this checkmark.png. And do, 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 do. so what I'll do is I'll put the check mark as a background image on my paragraphs. And so I got rid of the border or the background color, comment that out background image and then you put in URL parenthesis and then the name of your you could put it in quotes the name of your image which is checkmark.png and again make sure that it's called checkmark I think that's just what I downloaded uh, whoops 
to make sure. Homework, chapter five, checkmark.png. Let's see what that looks like. Okay. Now it's actually kind of hard to see, but there is a check mark on this. Can you see the little green right there on that paragraph? There is a check mark. Now this check mark is repeating. Okay, so it's a background image, but the background image is repeating. So that's, that's kind of the default, is that whatever your image is, it repeats. And you actually can't see, you can't see this because uh, like they both, they need to both need to have a, a taller height, right? So if I put the height on both my paragraphs, then you can kind of see them both a little bit better. Okay, so you can see there is a background image, but it's uh, it's probably not what you would expect, um, but but it's there. And so, number one, it's it's a big image. If you open up the image, check this out. We go to its properties to look at the details of the image. And 350 pixels by 350 pixels. So that's why the image is so big, right? Because it's a 350 by 350 image. And so if you don't know how to resize an image, it can actually be done pretty easily within Windows if you just right click and click on edit. And uh, this opens up Paint. And Paint's actually a real easy tool for resizing. If you click on, click on resize and then pixels, we could just size this down will maintain the aspect ratio so it, it's not stretched or anything if I just say 100 by 100 okay now it's smaller this is a smaller image and now okay well it's probably probably still not what I wanted okay because it's still repeating it's a smaller image but it's just repeating a bunch so let's let's mess with that let's mess with the background repeat so you got the background image going Background repeat, no repeat. Okay, now our background image is by default over there on the left. You can see we've still got that padding for this guy, so the text isn't overlapping the background image, right? So that's working out pretty well, but that's not there. But maybe you don't want your background image to be kind of off on the left which is where this third one, background positions, right? So we've done background image, we've done background repeat. Um, a couple other values for background repeat, instead of saying no repeat, you could tell it repeat just vertically, which is repeat Y. So repeat vertically is repeat Y. You might guess repeat X then is repeating horizontally, okay? And then by default, it's just like a tile. It does both. That's your default, is a tile. And then no repeat, it just gets it in there a single time. Okay, so that's your different background repeat. Let's still get background. If we look at the definition for background position, one or two relative or absolute values or keywords to specify, to specify the horizontal and vertical positions. Keywords are left, center, right, top, center, bottom. If vertical position isn't specified, the default is center. If no position is specified, the default is the top left. That's what we're seeing right now is we're seeing the default, the top left. So if we do background position center center so we get it centered and then like it said there you got the different keywords as far as left right center bottom so on and so forth or you can use X and Y coordinates you could say something like 50 pixels 300 pixels And that's obviously off the screen. So 50 over 30 down. Whoops. 
150 over throws it off the screen or no that's 50 oh the 300 30 30 messing with this so you can there you go that's 30 over and 100 down so you do the X positioning first the Y positioning second okay and again with uh, you could do that with every paragraph so now every paragraph is gonna have that background image if I do another paragraph with Lorem Ipsum you can see every paragraph is gonna have a background image on it there is a shorthand the shorthand that can do image repeat and position colors and so if we look at that here there's background color which we'll, we'll leave off image position repeat and attachment so let's try this background color so this is your shorthand so this is nice let's go up here these are our background tags so let's do the shorthand background URL the order of these don't matter so you could do any order URL no repeat and then the position will say center center And so you can get the same effect using this shorthand background property as, as all three of the long the longer notations. So they there's some several code examples of the shorthand. Several examples of repeating and position. Um, <clears throat> background attachment. Um, if you have a really big image the default is to scroll but a lot of times you'll see where kind of like the background stays still in the background while the content scrolls in front of you and so that's done with a background attachment of fixed and again a lot of times it's really hard if you put a background image on top of content um, it can make it really hard to read so you just for accessibility purposes um, be really careful with your background images if they're on top of content um, you know don't get too fancy and then all of a sudden make it really hard to use your website okay so you know again I, I like to think of like the popular uh, websites you know their their backgrounds are pretty simple you know for the most most part you know they're white backgrounds because it just makes the, the content easy to access Um, and then again, you do have these situations with large images and I scaled down the image one thing that another solution besides scaling down the image Let's see if I scale this back up to its original size Let's see if that blurs it. Hopefully that doesn't yeah, that's fine So say we got this really large image um, we can add in these properties here um, so background size contain will scale the image as large as possible without cropping or stretching so I guess the idea is that you'd have to have a small image but let's let's just code that real quick again the property is background size and the value is contain Kind of see what the outcome is here. So really didn't do too much on that one. Uh, let's try the other one. I think that's the default. So that's why I didn't do anything. Background size of cover. Background size of cover. 
okay and you kind of get this different effect where it's trying to cover as much of the background as it can um, so scales the image as large as possible without stretching if the portions of the image different from the element it is cropped either vertically or horizontally so that no empty space remains so it takes up as much of the background as it can is background of cover uh, last thing we have here is gradients um, again I really like the generator when it comes to background gradients um, this is the second time I've used this tool in this lecture let me go to the CSS3 generator it helps you understand what you're building and if I go to gradient okay so what you have here um, is a color gradient and you can get different kinds of gradients you can get horizontal gradient going across vertical going down diagonal gradients or radial gradients kind of coming from the inside and then your colors are set over here I always like to delete this stops like the most simple thing to do is have one color go to another and let's just do a vertical so you got this dark blue into I'll even change this color to be like a, a, a white you get this dark blue into a white and it gives you the code over here uh, again having the vendor prefixes like WebKit for Chrome Mozilla for Firefox backwards compatible old browsers so it gives you a lot of backwards compatibility here so let's go ahead and copy this gradient and what I'll do is I'll put this gradient on the body tag let me go ahead and format that so again um, I like using these tools not only because you can build out your own gradients but also they give you backwards compatibility and the vendor prefixes um, so to look at the page now you kind of see we got a gradient now just like before just like the images the gradient repeats right so if you were to zoom out you see the gradient repeating and zoom back in and so one thing to do so that the gradient doesn't repeat is you notice we faded into white Let me get an actual white all this there we go so then what I do is I just get rid of the uh, the background repeat copy let me paste that format it now we're going actually into white and then I'll throw in a background repeat no repeat on this guy so that that gradient doesn't repeat let me launch it in the browser I closed it now if I zoom out you can see there's no there's no repeating you just get a real clean background gradient and again all these different properties in here um, you don't have to memorize these you can use the tools to help you generate your gradients so I, I've never stressed the different properties in here um, if, if you want to dive into it it does explain it and again there's different kinds of gradients um, but again the tools help you generate those so that's my recommendation alright guys that is the end of chapter 5 tonight your assignment is to read chapter 5 Again, anytime it says reading on perusal, just read chapter five. And then I'll have your homework opened up on Inside Rankin for chapter five. That's due at the start of class tomorrow. And I'll stop the recording.